Uh, welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talk. It is a great pleasure uh, today to have with us Matei Ciocarli, who is uh, an Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Columbia University. Matei completed his PhD at Columbia in New York, and before joining uh, Columbia as, an uh, as a professor, he was a research scientist and group manager at Willow Garage and uh, a senior scientist at Google. His current work focuses on robot motor control, mechanism and sensor design, planning and learning, all aiming to demonstrate complex motor skills such as texture manipulation. As you can see from the bio I sent uh, along, uh, Mate received a number of awards, among which I noticed the Early Career Award by the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society and many others. So today he's going to talk about, uh, I guess, uh, he's going to give us a, a, a insights on mechanisms, sensors, and policies for dexterous robot manipulation. I've been following his work. I'm pretty excited about that. And therefore, I give you the stage, Mate. And sorry for the background noise. <laughs> no worries at all. And thank you so much for the invitation. I, I really appreciate it. I'm really glad to be there. Um, I know that I've been scheduled during the soccer game, so if you're shouting in excitement, please mute first, or unless you're shouting in excitement at the, the research that I'm presenting, which has never happened to me before, but uh, I guess there's always time for a first. So yes, I know I'm competing against interesting stuff, but maybe you know uh, I, can, I can pique your interest a little bit in uh, our work on robotic manipulation. So as Joella was saying, we do hands in my lab, dexterous robot hands, manipulation, an example of an interesting motor control problem. And uh, I think, you know, there's a little bit in manipulation for everybody, you know, so it, um, I'm a big believer in the fact that the way we're going to get to good, interesting, complex robot motor skills is by looking at all the components together, meaning kinematics, motors, actuation, sensing, and then of course, you know, the computational stuff, uh, what, what goes on in the, in the brain, the planning, learning, and, and, and modeling. And I also, I'm, I'm a great believer that intelligence can go into any of these components, right? That, you know, today it's, it's the big, you know, the age artificial intelligence is going through a really hot period right now. We're hoping it's gonna last. Uh, but I strongly believe that artificial intelligence isn't just confined to the, to the brain side of things, that we can have first class intelligence in the kinematics or in the actuation or, or in the sensing. And that's what we try to do in the lab. And today my talk is kind of gonna go all over jumping between these. So hopefully there's gonna be a little bit of something in here for everyone, uh, regardless of whether you're more on the hardware side of robotics or more on the software side, or maybe it, at the interfaces like we are. Uh, one thing though, please, you know, don't, you know, just stop and ask questions, you know, type them in the chat and then Joella will see and, and, and stop me or just unmute and, and ask a question. I'm, I'd much rather make this interactive than wait until the very end. Uh, and then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go on for a while. And then when we approach one hour, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and have more time for questions. So let me get started. Uh, I'm going to get started on the sensing bit here. And this is something that in my lab, we've been working on for quite a few years now, uh, because we felt strongly when we started, you know, back in 2015, when we started this project, there was just nothing out there that would give us tactile coverage that is incredibly rich in data, you know, that human tactile fingers are insanely data rich. You know, we have hundreds of mechanoreceptors per centimeter square. And also coverage, our fingers are so beautifully sensorized all around, you know, even on the backs of our joints, we have this complex accordion structure. So there's tactile sensing everywhere. We don't have blind spots. We don't have sharp corners or edges that would have blind spots. So uh, we felt that, look, there's nothing out there that works like that. Uh, so let's, let's build our own tactile sensors. And this, at this point, is work that's a couple of years old. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. I've already given a bunch of talks on this. So if you've seen this, just bear with me for just three minutes while I introduce the, the background of how we build our tactile fingers. So this is what the, the, the skeleton of the finger looks like. It's a 3D printed skeleton. Uh, and on top is a flexible circuit board that has a whole bunch of LEDs 
and photodiodes on it, right? So light emitters, which are the LEDs, and light receivers, which are the photodiodes. And then on top of this, we have a transparent urethane layer, so a waveguide. Essentially, uh, this transparent urethane, PDMS, it's about seven millimeters thick. It's a little hard to see here, but it is about seven millimeters thick. And we did our studies that showed us that that's the right thickness. Uh, and here you see also what it looks like with the LEDs turned on. And then on top of this waveguide, we have an opaque skin that's just uh, two or three millimeters thick. It's again, soft. And its main reason is just to be opaque, to block, to keep outside light from coming in and to keep inside light inside the finger. So if we take a cross section through the finger, you can see on the right what it looks like. Uh, we have the, the rigid skeleton. The PDMS is the transparent soft waveguide. And then on top of everything, we have the skin, which is reflective, keeps inside light in and outside light out. And then what happens in here, of course, it's a waveguide. So the LEDs emit light, which bounces around and then is measured by the photodiodes. And of course, we measure how much light goes from each LED to each of the photodiodes. And whenever this finger makes contact with anything, the waveguide deforms. So light gets bounced around differently. So the amount of light picked up by every photodiode from every LED changes, and that gives us a nice clean signal that we can measure. Uh, and the big advantage of, of doing it this way, if you're thinking, for example, you know, let's compare against something like, you know, gel site or, or, or Omnitech, it's a lot easier for us to cover complicated geometry, right? Because we don't have a CMOS or a CCD sensor. We have our photodiodes and LEDs kind of distributed all over the finger. <clears throat> so we can have a complex 3D geometry that's fully sensorized. So in particular, you know, we're getting lots and lots of signals because uh, we have a lot of LEDs talking to a lot of photodiodes. And we have coverage of the entire hemispherical tip and cylindrical body. So this is what the signals look like, for example, when you poke the finger, right? So we have about a thousand signals in total. The finger gets poked, and then some of those signals change. You know, Some go up, some go down. Beautiful signal to noise light has amazing signal to noise compared to electricity. You know, we, we tried piezo resistance, piezo capacitance, but once we saw the kind of clean signal to noise we get with light, we were hooked. So this is what the signals look like when our finger gets poked. So you see that we get a very rich signal set. And of course, the question is extracting information from there because it's not really interpretable analytically. So of course, you know, what we do with this what else in this day and age, uh, we use this as input for, for machine learning algorithms. So for example, uh, here what we're doing is we are training uh, a regressor to tell us based on the raw optical signal to tell us contact location and how much normal force is being applied. So here we're collecting training data we are poking the finger in controlled fashion with a UR5. So we know exactly where contact is happening. And we have a load cell uh, at the tip of a linear probe. So we know how much normal force we're applying. And then we use these to train a regressor. And then once the regressor is trained, this is what it looks like. So now the finger can tell us contact location, contact force. We've also done studies on multi-touch. We can also train a regressor for multi-touch as well. And, and that's in our papers. This is the one for single touch. Um, it's quite accurate. It's fast. We get this at about 60 Hertz and we think we can, uh, we can push it even further. And the thing we're excited, all of this complex 3D multi-curved geometry is fully sensorized. And then there's just one <clears throat> one wire coming out and connecting this to the rest of the robot hand. As many of you know, wiring is the death of the roboticist. 
any robot, you know, can you wire it up? That's what it boils down to. And because we do this multiplexing strategy, our finger is designed to be really easy to integrate with a robot hand, and that includes wiring. So of course, you know, we have all the numerical analysis in the paper, how precise it is and whatnot, but I'm not gonna spend too much time into the details here. Let's talk about what we do with this. So at this point, these fingers are for us commodity technology. We have about 15 of them in the lab. We can build more as needed. So here's an example of an application, something that we can do with these fingers, object recognition. So, uh, you know, can we, recognize objects based exclusively on touch. So we have a UR5 with one of these fingers attached to it. And there's a, a, a set of known objects, 10 objects in this case. And what we'd like to do is be able to place one, one, one of these objects in front of the robot with unknown translation and unknown rotation around the vertical axis, and then have the robot poke it and recognize what it is exclusively from tactile data. So no, no vision at all. So here you see our system in action. It's poking the object, it's collecting information. In the top right, you see its belief distribution over which object it could be. And then actually it ends up having the wrong uh, idea a little bit, but it's not very confident. You know, it knows that it its own prediction is not very confident, but then it makes touch on a very discriminative part of the object, which is the handle of the pitcher. And then it immediately figures out, no, this is actually object five, which is the pitcher. The probability goes to very high. And then very quickly with very little movement, uh, it, has, it has recognized what the object is. And we have a, a bunch more demonstrations here. So this is the, the drill and again, after the first couple of contacts, it, 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 it goes and it makes contact in a very discriminative part of the object and, and says what it is. So what's going on here under the, the scenes? So this is the um, architecture that we have. And this is a learning approach that has three main components. The encoder is the thing that takes information from our sensors. And in our case, it's contact location and surface normal at the touch and encodes it into a, a representation and we use point net plus plus. And then our main contribution is the other two components, the discriminator and the explorer. The discriminator is a supervised learning module whose job is to take in the representation and predict what object it is and also output its own confidence level. And then once the confidence is high enough, then we finish the process and we say, that's what the object is. If the confidence isn't high enough, then the explorer takes over and the explorer is a reinforcement learning policy who takes in the same information and its job is to say, what action should the robot take to explore next? And uh, the really uh, exciting thing about this architecture is that the discriminator and the explorer train together. They train in tandem. Tandem is also the name of, of this method. So the discriminator obviously learns to correctly recognize the object. And then the explorer learns to make the discriminator confident. So the explorer learns to go to the most discriminative parts of the object next. Uh, so they affect each other as they are training and they have to train in tandem because they, they affect each other. Uh, and then they converge where it, the explorer learns to make the discriminator confident as quickly as possible. So we train exclusively in simulation and then we do zero shot transfer to, to the real world. And we had a paper just a, a month ago at IROS showing this in, in 2D with 2D polygons and we have a paper under review for ICRA next year, which is what I just showed you, but the, this method applied to 3D objects. So very, very fast object identification from tactile data. It, it beats you know, baselines uh, quite uh, the, as you'd expect. So good, you know, great. We have this thing for one finger poking an object, but what we wanna do for real is hands, you know, not just one finger poking stuff, but full robot hands taking advantage of sensing to do real dexterity. 
And the task that we set for ourselves, a really hard one, we wanted to see if we can do in-hand dexterous manipulation with finger gating. So you can arbitrarily reorient an object for you know, arbitrarily large rotations, which ha you, you have to do with finger gating. You're not going to be able to do very large rotations without breaking contact with some fingers and then putting the fingers down somewhere else. And we also wanted to do it based only on intrinsic sensing. So no computer vision. We wanted this to be robust to any you know, issues that affect vision. So can we do something like this based just on tactile and proprioceptive information, which in particular means we have no information about the global shape of the object or the pose. We just know what the hand is feeling right now, the current context that the hand is feeling. And you know, we have the hardware, we, as, as I was saying, these fingertips were designed from the beginning to be integrated into a robot hand. So we have that you know, ready to go. So there you see what these fingers look like, uh, these tactile fingers look like on a robot hand. But first, you know, let's see if we can train the policies. And of course, we, we tackle this in simulation first in Mujoko. So since there is no global object information, the policy has to be hand centric. So we said, you know, is it possible to train a reinforcement learning policy that can rotate the object arbitrarily around uh, a hand-centered axis of rotation? So either, you know, vertical axis or a horizontal axis. Is it possible to train these very, very dexterous manipulation policies? And it turns out that if you just, you know, uh, apply, you know, off the shelf, you know, state of the art, you know, policy gradient actor critic methods it doesn't it doesn't learn and you know of course it doesn't it's it's a very hard problem it's a very unstable problem you know you're holding an object as soon as you're doing the right thing the object that sorry as soon as you're doing the wrong thing the object falls and you know it and and, and then it's gone or, or you just shoot it away even if you do a curriculum training without gravity it's easy to just push the object away to where it's irrecoverable so it's very hard for the learning process to explore. So uh, just naive sampling uh, doesn't work. Uh, what Gagan figured out is that we can address this with a very careful engineering of the initial state distribution. So if you have an initial state distribution or a reset distribution, depending how you wanna call it, that shows the policy uh, a bunch of relevant tasks, uh, sorry, a bunch of relevant states for this task that we've set, then the, the policy has a chance to train. And in the original paper that we had at ICRA this year, uh, we were hand engineering the reset distribution. In the meantime, we've made a lot of progress on automatically coming up with the right reset distribution. Maybe we're gonna submit something for, for RSS in January. This is what it looks like. Uh, after it's trained. So we, we had this at, at ICRA this year. And it turns out that it is possible to learn these very dexterous in-hand manipulation policies using only intrinsic sensing. So this uses just tactile sensing and proprioception. One thing to note, look how in the process of manipulating, it makes contact with the object sort of everywhere on the finger, you know, on the hemispherical tip on the cylindrical side of the finger, you know, on the front, not, not quite on the back, the back, the back is, is not sense right for us either, but most of the circumference of the cylinder is, the entire hemisphere is. So how important it is to have this ability to sense touch everywhere, you know, not just, hey, I have a little tactile array that I'm gonna retrofit on an existing finger and that's gonna leave all the corners and the edges of my finger blind. And that, that doesn't work. If you're gonna use tactile sensing and be dexterous you, you with it, you want to have this beautiful coverage all around the, the finger geometry. So there you go. Uh, you know, the, 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 the tactile fingers enable this kind of, of, uh, of dexterity when used on an entire hand. This allowed us to also do kind of a more in-depth study of you know, what kind of observations really matter. What do you really need in order to be dexterous? So 
in particular here, uh, when we're training these policies, we use tactile information. So contact position forces and normals. But then we also use proprioceptive information, meaning joint positions and joint torques. And of course, in, in simulation in Mujoko, you know your joint torques. You can control your joint torques very easily. Natively, Mujoko uses torque controlled actuators. So you have that information. Uh, so we asked the question, which of these sensing modalities is really important for, for manipulation? And it turns out that they complement each other. It's possible to learn dexterity with just tactile information. It's possible to learn dexterity with just proprioception, but you're not going to be as good. And if you have no, no contact whatsoever, you're still not, not going to learn well. So this is with, with proprioception, uh, joint angles, joint torques, and it doesn't learn. Once you start throwing in some tactile information, then it learns. But also tactile only without proprioception, which is number 12, it doesn't learn either. And the best, uh, the best policy is when you have, of course, all information, you have touch, you have proprioception, and then it, it, it learns the best. Let me see, I think there's a question in chat. So uh, what type of tactile information do we extract from Mujoko? Ah, that's a great question. We don't model the fingers as soft which I'm gonna to get to in a second is a bit of a problem for us. So Mujoko tells us contact location and uh, contact force. And then from contact location, since we know the geometry of our own fingers, then we can also get the normal. And we use the surface normal of the finger as at, at the location of touch as contact normal, okay? So to answer your question, Contact location, contact force, contact normal, and then we don't actually model the fingers as soft. And the reason that you know comes back to bite us is okay. Then we're gonna try to transfer that. We have ongoing work to transfer to do the the, the sim to real on this, and right we model in simulation the tip as non-compliant. So all compliance has to come from the joints, from the joint controllers. Uh, from the middle and distal joints. And it turns out that our policies, you know, they learn with the simulated compliance of about two Newton meters per radian. Then on the real hand, the tip is compliant, is soft. And then of course the, the, the joints themselves, which are dynamic cell servos, usually you like to make those very stiff because that's when the control performance goes up. And we measured the compliance of everything and it turns out to be an order of magnitude higher than what we were simulating. So there's a gap there. Our real hand is much stiffer than the simulated hand. And then at the very beginning, just immediate sim to real uh, didn't, doesn't really work because of that. And it also turns out, right, the, 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 if, 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 if you can fix this by making the real hand soft, Right? So you try to reduce the stiffness of the real hand. But then first of all, if you make the real, the, the control by, by messing with the control in the dynamic cells, right? You can ask the dynamic cells to, to have very soft controllers. But first what happens is that the tactile sensor doesn't work because you're not seeing enough deformation to actually measure contact very well. And also when you're taking a highly geared servo and trying to do very compliant control, that, that, that's not high quality control. You know, you get all kinds of gearbox friction and stiction effects that show up. So you can't really take the real hand, this hand at least, and make it soft, as soft as the simulation. If you make the simulation stiff by increasing the gains of the simulated controller, then it doesn't learn, exploration fails. And we've been working for a while now trying to really get to the bottom of this and understand what is it about compliant control that really is conducive to learning. And we have some ideas, but we're not quite all the way out of the woods yet. Uh, but this is what we're actively working on right now, in addition to you know, other ways to encourage exploration and make learning very effective for these very dexterous policies, we're learning on figuring out how to 
bridge this gap between the, the real mechanism and the simulation so that we can do uh, sim to real the way we've always wanted. Okay, so this, that's uh, our work on these highly actuated, very dexterous hands. Let me switch gears a little bit here, and uh, let's talk a little bit more about compliance. You know, how how do you get compliance in a robotic mechanism? And I'm sure you know this is something that many of you are very familiar with. One way, of course, is to have soft materials, you know, like the soft fingertip. Another way to get compliance is to have a compliant control law at your actuator, right? And at, as far as the contact is concerned, right, compliance can mean the contact behaving like a spring. You know, there's a force pushing on the object and the contact gives. It's behaving like a spring. And whether that compliance is achieved via soft materials or via a control law, it looks the same as far as the contact is concerned. It, it still behaves like a spring. Interestingly, there is another way to do, to do compliance, right? There's of course, you know, series elastic. You can do compliance via a compliant under actuation mechanism, right? Even if you have a, a rigid finger, a stiff controller and a stiff transmission, you can have compliance in the actuation if you have an under actuation mechanism. So, uh, because there's a, you know, you have fewer motors than degrees of freedom, you have a null space there, <clears throat> and inside that null space, you can be compliant. Which brings me to the, the, the second part of my talk, which is actuation. You know, can we leverage this kind of actuation level of compliance or under actuation level compliance to do clever manipulation? Uh, so why would you want to do that? We have a project going on, and this is work that you know, we've been doing for quite a few years as well, with NASA to build a manipulator for the AstroB robot. And the AstroB robot, you can see it here in these images. There are two AstroBs actually right now on board the International Space Station. <laughs> so an AstroB is a, is a free floating uh, robot inside the space station designed to do all kinds of monitoring tasks and various useful work inside the space station. So you can see it here interacting with astronauts. Uh, it can fly around, it can monitor instruments and things like that. And we've been working to answer the question, can we actually build manipulation capabilities inside the AstroB? Uh, here you see, we, we designed a little gripper inside our lab for the astro B to grab onto handrails so it can perch and not use energy when it can just you know stay still somewhere. And then the folks at NASA Ames uh, took our design and they, uh, they flight certified it so that now the astro Bs that are uh, in orbit have the, the perching grippers. But we wanted to do more than perching, right? We wanted to also have the ability to manipulate a wider range of objects. And you know, we we worked so Mike Massimino, who's a former NASA astronaut, he's the one of the people who fixed the Hubble telescope. He's at Columbia, his office is across the corridor from mine. We were very lucky in that sense. So we did case studies with Mike and we came up with a range of objects that we would like the astro be to be able to manipulate and move around, you know, act as a as as, as a gopher. Uh, and then based of this range of shapes, we came up with a kinematics, a set of kinematics for the hand that we would, that an enabled good stable grasps of all of these objects. Uh, and it's, you know, three fingers, eight joints in total. So a, a, a capable hand, a versatile hand that can do stable grasps of all of these objects. But then of course, you're not going to build a hand with eight motors and have it fit inside the astroby. The whole astroby is about 30 by 30 by 30 centimeters. The payload bay is 10 by 10 by 10. You're not gonna put a hand with eight motors inside. Plus, if you use up that much power, the astroby isn't gonna have any leftover power to fly around. So that's a no-no. So we needed a hand that was very compact, very low power, but still very versatile, able to drive all of these eight degrees of freedom so then it, it had to be under actuated, okay? So how do we design a hand that uh, is under actuated like that? Well, let's think a little bit of what's actually going on here. You know, we have this hand eight, 
degrees of freedom, eight joints, if we were to think about what the grasps look like for all the eight objects that we, for all the many objects that we'd like to be grasping, and then plot each of those grasps in the hand posture space. So the hand posture space is eight dimensional. There's one dimension for every degree of freedom. Every hand shape corresponds to one point in this eight dimensional space, okay? Because you have the joint angle specified for each joint. This is my best attempt of taking an eight dimensional posture space and, and putting it on a, on a two dimensional slide. So if you imagine where each of these desired grasps fall, they're gonna fall somewhere in this eight dimensional space. But then once you introduce under actuation, let's say you have just one motor, it means that on its own power, the hand isn't able to go anywhere in this eight dimensional space. Okay, under actuation, let's say here, I'm, I'm showing an under actuated transmission where you have a single actuator that's pulling on three tendons. And then these three tendons drive all the eight joints of the hand. So one actuator, three tendons driving eight joints. So this under actuation, what it introduces is a manifold structure in this eight dimensional space. So the hand when moving by itself can only move on this eight dimensional manifold. And the shape of this manifold is determined by the parameters of the transmission. What are the parameters of the transmission? Things like the radii of the pulleys that the tendons go around. Or we have the tendons flex the fingers. Extension is done passively via springs. So the stiffnesses of the springs or the preload of the springs, those also determine the behavior of the hand and implicitly the shape of this manifold. So when we're optimizing the design of this hand, what we're doing is we're trying to shape this manifold to hit all the, all the grasps that we wanna have. Uh, so we came up with various design optimization techniques that shape this manifold to hit all the grasps that we want while ensuring that we can still physically build this in a, in a real transmission. This is why we call this approach mechanically realizable manifolds. So this is what it looks like when it's done. This is an early version where the motor, there is no motor, it's just one person pulling on the tendons. And you can see, let me, let, me, uh, let me play this from the beginning. You can see how the fingers start. They create a spherical, a, a nice tripod grasp. Then the fingers come together and you get a nice pinch. And then the fingers kind of get out of each other's way and you get a, a powered enveloping grasp. And our optimization not only ensures that you get these beautiful synergistic movement, but also that all these grasps are stable. They're quasi statically stable, so you can pick up the object and you actually have stability there. Um, and this is, you know, with a single motor, this is why this hand is very compact. This is uh, the same thing, but with an actual motor. So, again, look at the synergistic movement that allows you to get all the grasps that you want, but then also have the fingers kind of get out of each other's way and, uh, and you get a power grasp. So, you see that it works like this with a real motor. And this is our uh, prototype on the Astrobe ground unit at NASA Ames, integrated with the avionics. Um, and in the time since, we've actually reduced the size of the hand even more. We haven't had a chance, unfortunately, to flight certify this design and send it in orbit, uh, but it is the right form factor and it can go into the payload bay of the Astrobe. So it's, it's, it's ready from that perspective. So in that sense, we were very happy with this design optimization method, but still some things were bugging us. You know, the, the target grasps that we would like this hand to execute had been chosen by a person. So if you want to think about it this way, you know, the, the planning bit where you decide which grasps you wanna execute so the planning bit had been done 
by a person and the optimization purely focused on the hardware, on the design. And this disconnect between planning and, and hardware, we, we didn't like it because, you know, maybe, you know, the person choosing the grasps chooses one that's just not well suited for underactuation. We, we didn't want that disconnect. So we kept asking, is there a way to optimize the, the planning bit, excuse me, and the hardware optimization together, jointly? And, uh, you know, it turns out that there is, and the approach that we took, of course, uh, in this day and age is of reinforcement learning, which at the end of the day, right, these, these uh, training algorithms, they're optimizers <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, so it makes sense that they're very powerful general purpose optimizers. So let me walk you through this process of using reinforcement learning for joint optimization of, of planning and, and hardware. Uh, so let me first, you know, just talk about what how does policy optimization work in general? Those of you who are RL experts, you know, and already know this, please bear with me for just a couple of minutes. So how does policy optimization work? You have a computational policy that takes in an observation and the job of the computational policy is to produce the motor commands. Then the motor commands get executed on the robot and then you get the next state, which is fed right back into the process. Typically, this computational policy takes the form of a neural network. Usually, you know, uh, an MLP, if you're doing sensory motor learning without vision, if there's vision, there might be a convolutional layers. It's a neural network. And then what is the optimization process? This neural network has parameters, the policy parameters, which are the weights and the biases of the neural network, usually denoted by theta. So the optimization process means you are finding the right betas so that the computational policy produces the correct action in response to the relevant observation. All right, so this is policy optimization, just vanilla policy optimization. Uh, it turns out that this process is very simple uh, inefficient, so you can't really do it on a real robot in many cases that we care about. So then instead of the robot, you have this general purpose black box physics engine, you know, Mujoko, Pi Bullet, whatnot. So what we said was, look, what if we actually take some parts of the hardware out of the black box physics engine? What if there are components of the hardware that we can simulate ourselves in a differentiable fashion and then remove that, separate that from, from, from the rest of the black box physics engine? More, more specifically here, the transmission. Right? What if we simulate the transmission ourselves? We know how these transmissions behave. We know the laws of physics that govern these tendon mechanisms. We can write those laws of physics as a computational graph. You know, it's no longer an arbitrarily structured computational graph because it has to follow the you know, Hooke's law and things like that. But we can write up the behavior of a tendon mechanism as a computational graph. And then, we're going to have the, the, the output of our transmission is joint torques. The input to the transmission is motor commands. The output of the transmission is joint torques. So in that sense, hardware behaves like a policy. It takes in input, it does something, and it produces an output. Hardware can be seen as a policy in, from, from, from that light. And it can be optimized like a policy. It'll have parameters, you know, just like a policy has weights and biases in the neural network, hardware will have, you know, spring stiffnesses or pulley radii or stuff like that. So there's a question, you know, can the manipulator adapt its force to different objects? The, so the, 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 the beauty of this is how the force gets distributed between the joints. What the transmission does automatically is it takes a single force input, which is one motor, and it distributes it to all the joints the right way so that you have stable equilibrium if the transmission is done well. It doesn't have, it doesn't reason about absolute levels of force, like, oh, this is a heavier object, so I'm going to need 
more absolute force. So in that sense, no, we don't do that. But what we do do is take one force and distribute it to all the joints in appropriate fashion if the transmission is, is properly optimized. So um, this is the you know, hardware as policy. We're seeing hardware as a policy and optimizing it along with the rest of the policy using RL. And in particular, the hardware here is the transmission, the thing that converts motor forces to joint torques. Um, so this is what it looks like unoptimized when you start off and everything is unoptimized, the transmission just does bogus things. After you've optimized the transmission, it knows you know, which grasp to use. That comes from the computational policy. The computational policy is also in charge of moving the, the palm around. And because we model our transmission in a way that's differentiable as a computational graph, then the whole thing is end-to-end -end differentiable. So we can take a gradient from here, from the refined action, all the way to the hardware parameters and the software parameters. So everything is end-to-end -end differentiable. So this is a lot more efficient than gradient-free optimization methods. We do it in simulation, but then we physically build the, the outcome of it. So here you see the springs, right? That's the, the or, or the pulley radii. The, the radius of that pulley is a parameter that's been optimized by reinforcement learning along with the computational policy. The stiffness of the joint spring is a parameter that's been optimized by reinforcement learning along with the computational policy. Uh, and then we put this on the, on, the real, uh, on the real robot. Now the computational policy is in charge of moving the wrist around. So the robot, the, the robot movement is determined by the computational policy. When to close the fingers, there's just one motor. When to pull on that one motor is determined by the computational policy. But then the actual behavior of the transmission is the mechanical policy that's optimized at the same time. Let me take a look. Uh, ah, okay. So, I, so, so there were more questions in the chat but not the case. Please feel free to keep putting questions in chat if you want to, uh, or, or we can chat at the end with whichever you prefer. Okay, so this is our hardware as policy work. Uh, let me quickly go through some more uh, recent work. Uh, I, we're getting close to the hour and I don't wanna go too long. So this, I'm just gonna move uh, a little bit faster with. Uh, um, a more recent extension of this work of, of hardware as policy we're going back to the idea of joint synergies. So patterns of coordination between joints as a more general concept. This is something that I did my PhD thesis on back in the day. Others have worked on this as well. But this idea that you have synergistic movement, that even for very complicated hands, there are synergistic patterns of movement, that the joints tend to move together. Uh, oftentimes for, for doing various tasks. So of course, you know, back to the seminal work by Marco Santello, who showed that just a linear uh, manifold for the human hand encapsulates most of the variance uh, for grasping day-to-day -day objects. So linear synergies, just two linear synergies encapsulate most of the, most of the movement of the hand for, for grasping daily objects. And here are Santello's uh, synergies uh, as we, we reuse them in, in our subsequent work. So in general, this idea of patterns of joint coordination is, is very powerful. Um, and there is a lot of work on joint synergies, but the way traditionally this has been done is you, you collect some data from some you know, high dimensional controller and then you do dimensionality reduction to see if you can find synergies in that high dimensional data. So you have this, this, this separated process of you, you need to have a high dimensional controller that collects your data, then you look for synergies. And it's not even clear, right? Your, your synergies are biased to the controller that you've used. And it's not even clear if the synergies you find are actually capable of solving the task that you started with. And along the same spirit of simultaneous optimization, end-to-end you know, -end optimization, I'm a huge believer in end-to-end in -end optimization. We try to ask, you know, is it possible to optimize a synergy model 
which, you know, what is a synergy model? It's something that, you know, goes from a low dimensional action space to the original high dimensional posture space of a hand. Uh, can we optimize that at the same time as the policy that solves a task? Uh, so, you know, we have a hand with many degrees of freedom here, you know, the shadow hand, I think it has 20 degrees of freedom. Um, we're looking for a synergy space that allows us to solve a specific task. So a policy that operates in the synergy space at the same time as the synergy model, or even more exciting, Let's solve multiple tasks. You know, is there one synergy model that allows us to solve many tasks? So we have this optimization framework where we're simultaneously optimizing a bunch of different policies, one policy for each task. And all of these policies produce an action that's low dimensional, it's synergistic. And then a single synergy model for all of these tasks. So, uh, and of course the synergies can be linear or nonlinear here. Uh, and this is what it looks like, for example. So we're saying that with just a three linear synergies, we can learn policies to turn valves of all kinds of, of different shapes. So we saw a valve with just zero handles, so just a knob, a valve with one handle, a valve with two handles, and here is a valve with three handles. So we have, and it's just a three dimensional synergy space and linear synergies, and they allow you to solve all of these tasks. Uh, if we're willing to use nonlinear synergies, then it can get even more powerful. You can do fancier tasks in very, very low dimensional synergy spaces. And again, the, the, the really distinguishing factor here is that we are simultaneously training the policy that uses synergies and the, and the synergy space. And you can kind of tell where we're going with this is that our ongoing work right now is to ensure that these synergies that we optimize are also mechanically realizable so that we can build physical underactuated hands with just few motors, two motors, three motors that can, that can solve all of these tasks because so far this, this has been in simulation. So, you know, all of these kind of lines of work coming together in terms of hardware as policy, synergistic, uh, synergistic behaviors, I'm, I'm, I, I strongly believe that we're going to enter a new golden age for this idea of hardware and software co-optimization, which is not new. You know, people have been working for hardware software co-optimization for a long time. But we have things now that they didn't have 20 years ago. You know, we have much better physics engines. We know how to do sim to real now with domain randomization. That's huge, you know, because 20 years ago, people were doing hardware and software co-optimization in simulation. You have to do it in simulation, right? Nature does hardware software co-optimization via evolution, which is such an amazing algorithm. Right? And our hardware you know, is optimized for our brain and vice versa, which is so powerful. But nature does it at the cost of building you know, millions of physical prototypes over millions of years. We can't afford to do that. So if we're going to do hardware software co-optimization, we have to do it in simulation. But now with domain randomization, we know how to transfer that, which is huge. And we have model free RL for the computational bit of it and for the optimization in general, which is so powerful, especially with you know, cloud computing infrastructure. So I'm a big believer that we're heading to this new golden age of, of hardware software optimization. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me wrap up one more project. This is a big line of work going on in my lab that unfortunately I, I didn't have time to, to, to talk about too much, but I know that there are many people you know, at, at ETH doing exoskeletons and rehab robotics. So we're building an exoskeleton for stroke patients. Uh, this is what it looks like. We're assisting stroke patients in opening their hand. Very often an after effect of stroke is spasticity and excessive muscle tone. They can grasp, they can hold things. That's not a problem. The problem is that they cannot open the hand. They cannot let go or they cannot open the fingers to grasp in the first place. So our uh, hand orthosis for stroke patients, this is a collaboration with the rehabilitation medicine department here at Columbia, is designed to be wearable to do intent inferral, if you look closely here, there's a, oops, 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 oops I, I, I pressed the wrong thing. 
Uh, there's a, an EMG, an electromyography armband. Let me find a good place. You can sort of see it here, the EMG armband. So we're trying to detect when the person is trying to open their hand and then provide physical assistance. So there's a lot of work that goes into intent inferral here, just understanding when they're opening their hand. The mechanical design of the orthosis is, is a big uh, you know, proud question here. You have to design it so that it's powerful. It can actually fight spasticity and open the fingers. The human hand is so strong, so amazing. You don't realize until you have to overpower it in a way, but you can't cause discomfort. Right? So you have to spend a lot of time thinking about the mechanical design and the interface of the, the computational part and the, and the mechanical part. So this is an aspect that I could easily give a one hour talk just on, on our hand orthosis project because we have a lot of things going on on both the intent in photo and the mechanical design side of things. But that would be an entirely different talk. Uh, but if you're curious about that, you know, I'd be happy to engage, you know, uh, after the questions in the questions or, or offline. But you know, to, 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 to bring it all together, you know, I hope that I've given you a sense that or convinced you maybe just a little bit that yes, it is the case that intelligence can reside at all of these levels for manipulation, which is our favorite motor control problem, but it's not the only motor control problem. There are many others, you know, locomotion comes to mind. And I think for all of them, it's really exciting to think about intelligence in each of these components and especially when they come together. And when they come together, we have this idea of co-design or co-optimization. Let's have mechanisms and policies that are optimized with and for each other. And that we think is really going to, to get us to, to the next you know, golden age of, of robot motor control. So with that, just a, you know, a shout out to everybody in the lab. This is something that I'm not gonna get into today. This is you know, uh, our uh, more recent photo of the lab and our amazing collaborators on the work that I've presented here. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mati, for the great talk. Um, let's open the stage for questions. You can either unmute yourself and ask or simply put it in the chat and I would read it for you. I'm also monitoring the chat, so. Yeah. So maybe let me start as an icebreaker. Um, I, I am intrigued by this idea of co-design as it, that, that's my, my PhD topic. So I, I really like the final part of the presentation in particular. I was uh, interested about this idea um, I, I mean, I've been following a lot of this differentiable uh, simulation or differentiability of hardware and software parts. And I was wondering, have you had any thoughts on uh, extending this beyond the planning and hardware design by designing also other components of the autonomy yeah. pipeline, like perception or localization or, you know, other, other pieces? That's a great question. So, I mean, so many, so many layers there. So first of all, the differentiable bit is important. And if you can do gradient based optimization, you can be so much more effective. Uh, I think differentiable physics engines are amazing. I know that many people are working on those and I'm excited. I can't wait for us to have a full per, you know, general purpose end to end differentiable physics engine. We're not building one, but I know that really good people are. So I think that's gonna be great. What we are doing also right now in the lab is we're trying to see if we can do optimization for things that are non-differentiable. Uh, and we have some ideas about how to have an architecture that kind of allows us to have the best of both worlds, to have the power of a gradient-based optimizer, even though we're optimizing something whose behavior isn't really differentiable. Uh, we're not quite there yet, it's active work. But if we do that, then it would be so great to optimize things like kinematics, morphology. Oh man, you know, it's, uh, and then for sensing, this is something that we'd love to do. Uh, for example, if you have a limited sensing budget, you, you're saying, look, my, my tactile sensing resolution is, is, is limited. How do I best deploy it? Where is the best place for me to put sensing? That can become part of the optimizer as well. And, and we have an idea how to do that for touch sensing and proprioception. 
haven't really thought about how you could optimize even, you know, higher level, if, if there's a vision component or, you know, or, or a planning component. If the, if the planning component is a policy, is an you know, end-to-end -end policy, then it can go in the same optimization loop with everything else, which can be incredibly powerful. If your localizer is different in nature, whatever, a particle filter, how would you optimize that? And, and, and can it tell you where to put your resources? Where, you know, where is there value? If, if I make my localizer this much more accurate, does it actually matter in the grand scheme of things given my robotic system? That's what we'd like to know via end-to-end -end optimization. And I don't know how you would do that yet, but I think it's, it would be incredibly powerful. Yeah, I agree with you. Those are important questions, very interesting. Um, any other question? I heard, I think I heard a I see a, a hand here. raised. Janja, you have your, your hand raised? No, uh, sorry. Yes. No, um, I, I don't raise my hand, but I, I have a questions. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for your very good talk. Um, as you said, you think human hand is very powerful. And uh, yeah, we have five fingers. And why do you uh, design the, the manual later using three fingers, but not five? So, I, you know, I don't think that we necessarily need to go to five fingers right away. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, a, it's we, we, we designed it with three fingers, the one for, for NASA, just based on intuition. You know, oh. just, just based know-how. You know, I've been in this field at this point for a while. So I know that, you know, the, the, the first things that you want, yes, it's the parallel grasp is the first thing you want. The next thing you're gonna want oftentimes is a tripod to get a stable grasp of a spherical object. So the, mm -hmm. the, the, the parallel, the tripod, and then you're gonna want kind of the pinch and then you're gonna want to envelop. This gives you the most bang for the buck. And intuition says you need three fingers to do both parallel, tripod, and, and all of these. Mm -hmm. So then for in-hand manipulation, we started off with four fingers. Three fingers isn't enough for finger gating if you're if, if you're if you're because you need three fingers to hold the object while the fourth one moves around and repositions itself somewhere else five fingers seems like it'll give you more capability to do finger gating compared to four although the policies seem to work with both so we've started off very intuition based but i'm that's changing you know ideally we'd like the optimizer to tell us that. We'd like the optimizer to tell us the morphology. You know, four fingers gives you this much quantitative benefit compared to three. Five fingers gives you this much quantitative benefit compared to four. And we can do that manually. It's like, hey, let's try to train a policy for four fingers. Then let's try to train a policy for five fingers. Let's see which one gives you the most return. That's good, it's better. It's still not great. Ideally, we would have this amazing end-to-end -end optimizer that also optimizes kinematics and morphology, which tells you, hey, this is how many fingers you need to learn this task. And, and we're not there yet. One thing I, I, I advise against is just blindly copying the human hand. I think that's a path to, to nowhere. If you say, okay, look, five fingers, because that's what the human hand hand, and then let's try to, to get the kinematics of the human hand. The kinematics of the human hand are insanely complex. They're very hard to copy. If you try that, you're gonna leave stuff out and you might throw the baby out with the bathwater. So don't copy the human hand, use your intuition, make it non-anthropomorphic. And ideally we're getting closer to the point where we have quantitative data that you know, a four-fingered hand is 20% better than a three-fingered hand. That, that's, that's, that, that's, I think, where the field should move towards. Yeah, OK. Yeah, thank you. And another, another question is about the sensing at the beginning of your talk. I don't know if I understand it rightly. Does it depend on optical signals? So yeah, it means it can only work in a yeah, pro, pro bright, uh lighting conditions. So the finger itself, yes, it uses optics. It has LEDs and photodiodes inside the finger, but we have the opaque skin on the outside. So we don't yeah. care what the lighting is 
outside. The outside, it can be anything because we have this opaque skin that isolates the waveguide from, from the outside world. So wow. uh, yeah, if, I mean, if you, if, if you shine a very bright light, maybe some of it will get through, but in typical indoors conditions, that's, that's not a problem. So yes, it is based on optics, but that's under the hood. You don't need to care about that. It doesn't affect what you need to be doing outside the finger. No, okay. Yeah, that's all of my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yandie. Um, you any other any other question? Doesn't seem so. Thank you very much, Mate. It was a great talk. I will follow up with some questions. Slash, uh, I will show you some some of the work I have been done in the area. I think it might be some some fit because of these optimization ideas. Uh, but very cool work and and good luck for the next steps I yes please i would i would love to follow up let's do that and thank you so much again for the invitation it was a pleasure great and now we can check uh, what's the score what's uh morocco what was it morocco against spain okay let's, let's pretend that we haven't been following until now <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you take care and have a great thanks day thanks a lot everyone bye-bye